Ladies and gentlemen in the audience here and watching live around the world on Facebook, welcome to Glengoyne Distillery in this rather cold November evening. Uh, and we are standing here in warehouse number one at Glengoyne. And the reason we're here is to celebrate the launch of Teapot Dram batch mm. number six. My name's Stuart Hendry. Uh, I've had the uh, uh, pleasure of working here for, uh, since 1996. I'm joined by Robbie Hughes, Group Distillation Manager, and by probably the two most important people here, uh, Duncan McNichol and Billy Edmondson, that are standing over there. Both of these gentlemen have been here since the 1970s and are a fundamental reason that we're all standing here drinking something called Teapot Dram this evening. Uh, in the audience, we have amongst us a hand-picked selection of some of the finest uh, journalists and bloggers in our industry. And by hand-picked, I mean, firstly, they had empty diaries, and secondly, <laughs> they can drink and take notes at the same time. They're an elite force that we have with us. Uh, Robbie and I are going to talk you through uh, how this dram tastes, uh, what our thoughts on it are, uh, and a few more things beside. Uh, and then we're going to take some questions from both from our audience here and from our friends on Facebook. So Facebook friends, get your questions in now and we'll come back to that shortly. Uh, but before we do all that, we'd like to tell you a little bit about a process in the industry known as dramming. And dramming is something that's widespread throughout the industry. And Robbie, having worked at uh, 12 distilleries before here, will know all about that. And Robbie, what was dramming and, and what does it mean? Dram, well, dramming back in the day was uh, more prevalent than Wi-Fi is in Scotland. You know, it was done everywhere, up and down, north, south, east and west. Every whiskey distillery in Scotland would have done dramming. And what the dramming was, it was part of your terms and conditions when you worked in a whiskey distillery. First thing in the morning, you would form an orderly queue outside a designated spot, which is usually the brewer's office, and he would give you a dram in the morning from... For most people, from the distillery you make, so it came fresh from the still. And the size of dram, you'd be lucky to hold it in that glass. So you got that at the start of your day. So that was to kick you off. That was to wake you in the morning, more than you could hold in this glass. And then you'd get another one sometime around about lunch, just to give you another boost for the day. And then in the evening before you go home, you'd get another glass of that. So that was dramming. That's what went on for decades centuries throughout the whisk industry and it was it was everywhere and it was probably stopped around about but it was meant to stop in 1974 the health yeah. and safety and work act came in uh -huh. uh, but in scotland we were a wee bit uh, reticent about joining that so it took a took about a decade after 1974 before we came to halt it was like trying to stop a an oil tanker in the ocean we turned off the engine but we couldn't really stop and and robbie why would the why would distillers give so much whiskey to their workforce on a daily basis. What's the, what's the thoughts behind that? Yeah, I mean, there's, it was, again, it was, it was expected, but the thought was, if you give it to them, they won't take it. Uh -huh. So if you control it, so you give them what you want them to get, which was generally the new make spirit, then that would stop the guys uh, going into the warehouse and perhaps help themselves to some of the uh, more expensive, prestigious stock that you didn't want them. So you give them what they wanted, and what they wanted was a dram. And generally, as long as they had the dram, they were, they were happy, Stuart. That's what they were looking for. I mean, these two guys over here, they're nodding their heads. That's what you were looking we're for. You, you. You. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what it was about. It was about keeping everybody at a certain level of inebriation. You know? And uh, when, when, I, when I started, I was 18. And uh, I, I've said this to you before, uh, Stuart. The pension, the pension scheme loved the whisk industry because we never made it. We never made it. it was sad. You know, the, the, I remember the first guy that made 65. It was a massive event at the distillery <laughs> I started at because somebody actually made 65. You know, and uh, because we were, we, were, we were pretty well inebriated for the whole of your working life. That's, well, that's what it was about, to be honest. It was to keep people on a nice level of drinking. And so change days now? It's changed days now. Yeah, it is changed days now. I'm, I'm glad to say. Uh, Billy retired a few, few months ago. Uh, after being here almost 40 years. Uh, so no, now it's, uh, we've got, everybody's got a different head. It's all about responsibility. Yeah. So about, about eight years ago, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we were having this chat with, uh, with these two great guys over here, and they started telling us about their experiences at Glen Goyne. Uh, and it was just such a, a good story, and it made me, it made me feel, uh, 
feel quite warm inside and quite happy. It was just a, a lovely wee tale. And as a result of that conversation, within about maybe about a year and a half later, we brought out the first teapot dram, just to really celebrate these guys and the, and the people that worked with them back in the, in the dramming days. And the whiskey industry is about, about people as much as about processes and flavour and brands and things like that. Uh, and I just want to, at this point, bring in uh, Duncan over there on the far side and, and Billy standing beside him, just to talk really about the, uh, about the story that you told me back these few years ago about how it transpired at, at Glen Goyne. So Robbie's already covered the fact that at most other places you got something a bit more rough and ready. You got some new make from the stills, some, some moonshine, some, some raw spirit. Uh, and yeah, it was different here at Glen Goyne. So what was, how did that work at Glen Goyne? Got the good stuff. <laughs> I like the good stuff, so that's how we got it. <coughs> got two a day. Friday you got three drums. You got one yeah. for the road. Yeah. Home. Uh, but by good stuff. I mean, uh, nineteen bill. Choice then, of anything in the warehouse. Or? Aye. Well, he went. He went in. Ten year old whiskey. He went in and helped himself at night. But <coughs> usually the cast we got was the nineteen sixty five sherry. Old Spanish sherry cast. Montelado or something like that. Uh, yeah. It was beautiful. Oh, so you have got a, a, a specific cast then in the warehouse Aye. that he just kept for himself and he would have gone to that and he'd, him being a distillery manager, he'd have been pretty cute. He'd have took it down to a certain level uh, for the angel's share. You know, the angels were quite busy in that, in that yeah. cask. Me too, the rest. <laughs> then, uh, obviously, the devil's got as much as the angels. Yeah. But he would have took it to just a point where he thought, if I take any more, it's probably... And then he would have moved on from a 1965 to a, a 1966, perhaps. So he'd have, he'd have made sure you guys were uh, getting the good stuff, but perhaps not getting the family treasures, the jewels, right. perhaps. Oh, that was quite because, good. I don't know. It's quite uh, good stuff, it's isn't good it? good whiskey. There's been 1955s lying it's around whiskey, yeah. that you guys might have let yourself into if you were, yeah. if you were allowed to. So, <laughs> so, I can talk us through your first day. So you arrive here. What age are you? And what did you think when you sat down in that restroom at I don't know well, half past eight, nine I was in the morning? Nineteen when it started, and I sat down in the restroom and just like you say, Stuart, you're sitting there, and uh, they're coming round with this dram for you. You think oh, I, don't, I don't like whiskey. You know, I really didn't like whiskey at that age. I think I really don't want this, so I'm sitting holding it. And then one of the older guys actually noticed, and he was sitting, he just went and that, put my hand down, so that was fine. So of course, once the brewer went out, he said, put it in there, son, put it in the, in the, in the, in the um, teapot. So I put it in the teapot, and obviously that was used for somebody else to have later on. Um, you, got, you got wise to it, and you learned very quickly. I mean, I loved the job, starting the job and everything else, but this drumming, not at the beginning. I wasn't too keen on that, but after about probably a good year, year and a half, I kind of took it. I thought, you know, I've wasted a lot of drums here, you know. You're still taking it quite well, if Robin like it. I'm going no bad for me, you And so you start drinking at that time in the morning with something this size. I mean, uh, you can do your work fine, you can... Yep, yep. There's no uh, problem. We didn't have a problem. That. We've not lost MD at all, I mean, no, 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 no. We haven't lost MD, no. So... Uh, <laughs> and so into the teapot I would go. And then, and Billy, did you do this, or did you manage to somehow drink all yours from day one? Well, at first you start it, but later on you get used to it. So. Oh. And the older boys would presume they liked the younger guys who were filling up this teapot. Oh, so then, and yeah. so then, instead of getting three drams on a Friday, yep. are they going back up in between to have a little cup of tea? Or? Yep. There was always a dram in the teapot. Always a dram in the teapot. You know, a lot so of folk never took it. Uh, but anyone yeah. could go up there at any time in the day and pick, pick a wee dram out of the teapot. The, the, night shift, the night shift boys would have benefited because they didn't get it during the day, yeah, yeah. so there'd be something in them in the yeah. teapot. No, they got the a sample yeah. bottle. So they got a, they got a sample, sample bottle. bottle left oh, so they got a sample yeah, bottle yeah, as well as the teapot yeah. drum as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's the last night shift. Night shift was looked after as well. Oh, yeah, how, many, how many units of alcohol will be on back then? Oh, I don't know. Nobody even counted. It was definitely treble figures, probably. Different days. Incredible. So different, yet, like I say, the work went on. Yeah, no, yeah. Nobody, nothing suffered. Um, I don't think it did anyway. We all managed to do well. And, yeah. So. I wonder we got through, but... <laughs> you know, the one, th the one thing I've never asked you guys is, so you, you don't do it the first 12 months or so, but then you're doing it for a few years before the yeah. practice ends. So on the day it stops, how do you feel then? Do you feel a kind of itch? Do you feel a need for... A, oh, you was, it. It, was it harder? Did you miss yeah, it? Yeah, it was. Right, it was right. Because you enjoyed it. 
you really, really enjoyed it. Like, you look forward to your dram coming, you know. Um, used to think to oh, well, it's lunchtime, get a wee dram, you know, but you know, and a blather, you know, because you always do this wee blather for ten minutes, five, ten minutes um, with a wee dram. So, yeah, you, you, you did miss it. You did. Wonder time was worse. Jeez, you got heat in you. Uh, well, especially these boys who were outside, you know. Aye. When you're outside, you outside, you enjoyed that in their, in their heat, if you like, you know. Well, that's the kind of whiskey. I mean, when we actually get into doing actual tasting of this in a few minutes, you, you will realise that the, this teapot drum isn't like any of the core range that we have here at Glengoyne because it was meant to do a different job. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the core range are, you know, more mellow, a yeah. different style of whiskey. Yep. You know, you guys were drinking this because it, you were working in a, in a warehouse yep. colder than this yep. in the middle of winter and you were there for eight or nine hours. Yep. Or you could have been perhaps throwing three tonnes of draft out of the mash tun by yeah. hand. Or back in the 60s, you'd have been raking out the, f the coals from underneath. Mm. So the, so the job was I. different. Mm. So you were getting a whiskey that was really going to give you that punch, see, you know, yeah. and it was going to hit you here, yeah. but it was going to get the blood circulating to your extremities. Yeah, so you'd, so, so you, you would be, <laughs> yeah, so you'd, so you'd be working hard. You know, that was the idea. It was, it, that, yeah. that whiskey had a job to do. Uh, it. it was never yeah. meant to be domesticated, this whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, uh, it, was, it was a job for people who had a hard job to do. And that's what I'm hoping we'll get when we taste it as well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you yeah. I was thinking about this a little bit earlier. So, I mean, 1970s you were doing this. But in the 1870s was the time when Glengoyne oh, changed. Oh, the year then, Rob. Well, <laughs> <laughs> just a wee bit later than that. But. So, 100 years before you were doing your dramming, uh, the distillery manager arrived here by the name of Cochrane Cartwright. Mm -hmm. And it was as a result of his family connections that Glengoyne first got a really steady supply of sherry casks. So from 1833 when we opened to 1870s, the casks might have varied from filling to filling and therefore the flavours would have varied. But in terms of the, the signature style of Glen Goyne, we can trace that back to the 1870s and to this regular supply of the same sherry casks we're using today. And they were able to do that because his family imported, uh, imported sherry into Glasgow and distributed it, so hence the empty casks came to the distillery that they, they just bought. That was the, the Lang Brother days. So I love the fact that 100 years before you were doing it, it seems like a long time ago in the 1970s, but in the 1870s, it was the same spirit made the same way. It was in the same casks. Mm -hmm. They probably had the same problems with the workers stealing the whiskies as you boys were doing in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. They had the same method of dealing with it, which is give them a little bit and that will keep them right. And it's just one of these things about the industry where time seems to move quite slowly. And actually some things change, but a lot of the really core things don't alter very much. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you know, had they not been in prison, your great-great-grandfathers could have been in that role mm -hmm. at the distillery, yeah. uh, doing exactly what you were doing 100 years later. Yeah. It's just nice to think of it that way. So, Robbie, now, the, uh, now that, and indeed Billy and Duncan, the time's probably right to, to taste this uh, wonderful thing here. Uh, and we're going to do that in a more sort of traditional way, the same way we would do with wine or with any whiskey or anything. We're going to look at it, we're going to smell it, we're going to drink it, and we're going to smile a lot. Uh, so starting with the colour, and it's a little bit darker in here, Robbie, but what have we got going on in the glass here? Well, I mean, straight away, the, co the colour tells you what kind of casks, uh, casks it's been in. I mean, the colour is deep. You know, it's, I don't know whether you class that as deep amber, or almost very rich, dark copper. But that tells you, just by looking at that, that's been in, into the casks that Billy mentioned in the, uh, in the video that we saw earlier, that this is European sherry casks, Either first fill or just all just pure sherry, you know, it's... Yeah. Uh, I think there's... And when you hold it against it, you probably see, I don't know whether the camera's got a good, a good image of that for the people on, uh, who are watching this, but it's so dark. And that's, that's all natural. And so, good time to talk about age, because a whiskey as dark as this, you hold it up to someone in a bar and you say, guess how old it is, and it's obviously a trick question, because no one in their right mind is going to guess how young this is unless they've been somewhere like here and seen how much sherry can be brought in, particularly through European oak in the, in the samples up there behind us. So this whiskey is a mix of casks that's eight and nine years old. So officially, this is an eight-year-old whiskey. And the colour of it, people think it's a quarter of a century old or something like that. And that colour just obviously comes from, from first fill sherry casks. And the reason that, that for that, both the age and the sherry cask, is to try and mimic what you guys had and I remember the first few batches we would sit down and taste them with you and you, I said was it the same as before and you said I can't quite remember those days and, and you know with these kind of conversations but uh, it's dark it's rich uh, smells absolutely amazing but it's really quite young and we're quite 
proud to say how young it is because this is a, a non-age statement whiskey uh, and it's deliberately this age because uh, it will vary slightly batch to batch like your dram would so we don't put an actual age on it we'd proudly put eight year old on it if it was always going to be eight year old next year it might be seven year old and nine year old cast mixed it's just trying to recreate a flavor with young whiskey and young whiskey can be absolutely magnificent and that is one of my favorite things about this you don't have to wait 20 years to get something like this uh, as we talk through it and as you taste it here You'll notice it's not an old whisky. There are very many clues that give it away. It is quite spirity. It's quite high strength. But a lot of the characteristics that you'll find in a Glengoyne 21-year-old that are cask derided are already st starting to come in here. And I just think it's, it's great to try something like this mm -hmm. so young, Robbie. I mean, there's something about the Glengoyne New Mix spirit. I don't know whether it's just a chemical composition, but it just brings out the colour and the flavour so early in its, uh, during the maturation that uh, other distilleries I've worked at in the past, not that many use the same kind of cast, but they just don't extract the same amount of colour so quickly as Glengoyne. So that's really why it doesn't need to wait so long. You might find other distilleries could be 14 year old, 12, 14, before they manage to get that much colour. But this is straight from the cask. This is cask strength. So it hasn't been you know, diluted, there's been no water. It's 59.3% alcohol. So if we both fall over in a heap, You'll, you'll know why, because this is very strong stuff. Uh, this, but this is, what, this is what you end up looking like over there, those two guys, when you drink this. If, I mean, we've got Blair over here. Blair's, Blair's a young guy in the back hiding. Blair's 20-year-old and looking bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. But that's Blair's 40 years from now, after drinking 40 years' worth of uh, cast-strength whiskey. And that's, that's the future, and it's great. Yeah, you must be really proud. You know. And it's been a good 40 years. You don't remember it. It was a good 40 years. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we'll go, we'll go by the whiskey. As Stuart says, I mean, it is young. It is young. There's nothing in Stuart's wardrobe younger than this whiskey. You know, it, it is really, really uh, quite fresh whiskey. But that's why, that's what it had, it had that job to do. You know, it, this whiskey was there. It wasn't at a time when you could work from home in your onesie, you know, drinking cappuccinos. Back then, you actually, actually do a hard job. So you needed a hard whiskey, which would get right to the heart of it. So we know just by smelling it, and if you've all had a smell, it's big. You know, this, my very, the very first whiskey I drunk was this kind of similar to Duncan. I was, I was very young when I started. I only ever had a blended whiskey before I started working, working in the whiskey industry. To hit, have one of these on day one, it was a revelation. It really was. It was a baptism of fire. And when you actually know this, you know what's coming because... It's, it's, it's such a big smelling whiskey. I mean, what you're getting in there, it's, it's uh, spicy. The, you know, I, I, I struggle to think of any Glen Goins that I've nosed where I can recognize such a wide amount of flavors. I'm not maybe the industry's best nose, and well, I might recognize three or four things. There'll be people in this audience that will tell me there's eight or 10 things. But with this thing here, there's just such a lot going on. And every time you go back to it, you get something else. The first time I smelled it, I got a kind of a warm leathery smell. Uh, as opposed to cold leather, uh, and you get uh, a little bit of rose petal, uh, you obviously get sherry and you get oak, uh, and almost a little chocolatey hint. There is, uh, there is that dark, rich, cherry kind of nose coming through, but uh, what I get, and as I'm, you know, Duncan, who was a stillman for many years, you do get that fruity notes coming through, because it's young. You know, the ca although the cask has had a massive influence on the colour, which you can clearly see, it hasn't as, is, as a big an influence as, say, a 21-year-old Glengoyne. So 21 year olds in the same, in the same kind of casks, it takes more of the youthfulness, the spirity side of things, where this is only eight, which is, which is very young for a single malt whiskey. You've still got that, uh, I'm getting, you know, it's like a pineapple smell to me coming through it. You know, you're still getting that fruity notes coming through. And that's what uh, Duncan and his colleagues in the distillery, that's what they're trying to achieve. And it's still captured, so the cask hasn't removed that. It's still very much there in this. So I'm interested in your fresh fruit analogy, and that's the smells in the, in the still house as you're walking by. If we leave these in the same, in the same cast until 21 or 25 year old, there's fruit there, but it's not fresh. It's now dried fruits, it's, it's raisins, yeah, it's, it's more like Christmas, it's Christmas Christmassy, cake, it's crystallized through. sugary yeah. fruits. It's, it's, it's a different animal altogether. You know, it's, this, is, this isn't one of your, your pipes and slippers stroking the Labrador in front of the fire, whereas perhaps the older, you know, the 21 year old Glengoyne, that's what they are. This is, this is a different beast. 
you know, this is really going to give people a, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge, you know, and, that, and that's what it's meant to be. As I said earlier on, it's meant to get the blood flowing this. It's meant to get you want it working. That's what this, I know it's a struggle with you, Billy, sometimes. <coughs> but that was the idea, it was to stimulate, it was to stimulate the guys. Never, never let them get below this point. Because then they start getting asking questions about pay rises, you know. So you try and try and keep them a wee bit glowing. Uh, you're a hard man, Ruby. <laughs> and in terms of the taste, uh, there's, a, there's definitely a. Well, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to when you taste it, you're going to think there's a there's a high alcohol content, which there is. It's nearly 60% alcohol, but there's still that kind of spiritiness in there that you associate with the younger whiskey. That's unmistakably there too. But then behind that, there's an awful lot going on. It's. Uh, You've got that nice wee gentle grab to the throat. Yeah. It just gives that nice wee spurdy coming down. But you've got that close, you've got that woodiness coming through. Cinnamon. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot a, of pepper. Yeah. You know, which you don't normally associate with going going. There's pepper in it. You guys get is it taking you guys no, back? Don't yeah? agree with you, yeah, right? you're getting that peppery notes coming yep. through as well. Yeah, <laughs> Especially as it's it's just a whiskey you'll still be tasting tomorrow morning. And it's, it's a very, very long finish and it, for me that you get the peppiness on the tongue and the longer it's, it's more related to the finish with me it's the last thing i taste is that tingly yeah. peppery tongue yeah. that there's, a, there's a lot of that going on you're right i think if you uh 15 20 minutes you'd still be tasting that peppery notes coming through are you guys all getting that in the back you're getting the peppiness coming through like when you have a really great steak and there's peppercorn sauce on it and then you get the peppercorn between your teeth in the taxi on the way home it's one it's one of those i think Sorry for all the, the vegetarians in the audience. Uh, I'm going to do something uh, which uh, can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. I'm going to add some water. Uh, personally, I, I love this with water. Uh, and I think it's, we do struggle sometimes when we're adding water to a, a, a sherry cast matured whiskey if it's much older than this. So with our 21 and our 25 and our 30 year old, I think both of us have drunk them all more than once, haven't we? Yeah. And, and when I put water in 25 or 30 year old, it just seems to dry it. It seems to not add to my pleasure. And this is a very strong sherry cast matured, but it's much younger. And for whatever reason, maybe you can explain it to me, the water seems to work for me really well with this. It doesn't dry it out. It just takes away the alcohol. It brings up all the fruitiness. Yeah, so. No, you're right. with, the, with Glingoin at a certain age, it is, it's around about the mid 25s. When you add water, it almost just puts a dividing line and just brings the, the oakiness to the front. Yeah, whereas when it leave it at full strength, the alcohol just keeps that down. It just keeps it at a level. Uh, but younger Glengoins, it doesn't do that. You can add water with this, this type of whiskey and it, and it kind of marries in it. It just blends in really quite nice. Uh, I wouldn't add water to that. I would just leave it as it is, personally. Uh, but I do mind. <laughs> I'm not gonna ruin mine. It's not as good as this. It is, but it's still very good. You know, mm. it doesn't do it any harm. What you've done there <laughs> is you've just just took some of these very strong flavours, the alcohols, and just kind of subduing them a wee bit. You know, uh, as you said earlier on, perhaps just a, a drop or two, Duncan brings it mm. to it in line. Drop, uh, but I think just really in honour of, of what this whiskey is about, mm. and in honour to all the guys that drank this from all the decades before, I think I would keep this as it is. You know, and you yeah. can actually just now feel it hit, hit in the stomach, you know, and uh, ready for a fight almost. You know, you're getting that nice, nice glow about you. It's, it's, that, it's that kind of whiskey. It's, it's, it's really good. It's good. So we're going to uh, start taking the first of our questions, I think. Uh, and they've been filtering through onto this little device in front of me as we go. And some of them have already answered. Naresh asking about how old it is. Uh, Bjorn asking about the type of sherry cast that we use. I think we've covered that. We've got a question from Johnny Allen on Facebook. Uh, Johnny uh, has clearly had a drink because he says he's thoroughly enjoying the presentation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you, Johnny. Uh, and Johnny's question is, do we ever experiment with any other sherry casks or do you find the spirit is most suited to Oloroso sherry casks? We've, we do concentrate mainly on the Oloroso because it's what we've always, we've always done. We've done uh, PX, Amontillados, we've uh, done a Fino here and there, I think, in the past. Mm -hmm. We've done one or two of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And they all, do, they all do work very well, don't you? I mean, they are what they are, but it's one of the, it's these tried and tested things. We do single casks, 
every now and then. We release these in the past, yes. and, they're, and they're fun, you know, uh, and they can be hit and miss. Sometimes they're, they're the absolute amazing whiskies, and sometimes you can think, well, thank God, it's just a single cask. But we do, we do try the sherries because Glengoyne does very well with these uh, sherry casks, various combinations. Can you think of any of the tries of PX? Motelados, yeah, uh, with, with some really nice fino, there was yeah. a Paolo Cortado cask That's right, yeah, in yeah. 1988, I seem to remember, yeah. that was, that was yeah. brilliant. And I think Johnny's right to use the word experiment. So in our 10-year-old, in our or 12-year-old, or 15, yeah. 17, 18, 21-year-old, we, we want people to taste the same thing every time they drink it. So the recipe stays the same. And the word experiment's the crucial thing, because what we can do is then find limited releases, single casts, etc. And Johnny, I think if you hang around long enough, you might find some interesting sherry casks uh, uh, coming out in the future because it is fun to buy in small parcels parcels, and kind of see what works. And if our story is all about sherry, then sherry is a logical thing to do that with rather than going down a rum cask route or, yeah. or, or something maybe of that nature. Um, so. We have even tried it with Madeira in the past. We've tried... Uh, Madeira works well. Madeira is very well. Ruby port. Uh, we've tried all different kinds of things, Johnny. It's... Uh, I think that's one of the benefits of working for a, a company as we do. We, we, we are willing to bring in these casks and let, let us all run amok, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, just have your own, your own warehouse full of all these uh, casks. And if they don't work, well, you don't do them again. If they do work, the sad thing is, and you've got to wait another 12 or 15 years before, <laughs> you know, before you've got it. But uh, we're here for a long time. That's actually a good question. So any uh, questions from our live actual Flesh and Blood audience in the room with us this evening? Would anyone like to ask anything or? Yes. Hi, uh, I was wondering, we're on batch six, I believe this is, which is your favorite and why? Good question. We, we actually talked about that earlier. What, well, from the batch six or from these six batches? From the six batches, yes. Which is your favorite of the teapot drums so far? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you remember them all now? The f <laughs> batch one, was good because I always, I always remember batch one because of the first time we did it and uh, it wasn't quite I don't think it was quite as strong as this one but it, it was we, we were just trialing it out and uh, getting a lot of advice from these guys of what was the right whiskies so batch one was particularly good pretty much like the very first child you have the 11 then all the rest of them are annoying after that point you know hopefully the kids aren't watching at home yeah. uh, but no uh, batch two was very good I thought we I thought we kind of Dropped a wee bit for the, a couple of batches. wasn't wasn't particularly bad, but I don't think I think we hit it really hot, really very well for the first two. But this one, uh, from my initial taste, uh, is it's, it's very it's as good as batch one, if not a tad better. I think the nose on this is absolutely amazing. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Super nose. It's it's one of the finest uh, Glen goings I've ever nosed. Uh, but just it's got that nice taste. It's just a little bit the young into the young the, the cherry influence. The, the hard work that Duncan and the team put in all those years ago, it's captured in, in this bottle and it's done very well. So between number one and number six are my favourites. With me, it would be number, it would be this and number two. Uh, I, I, I absolutely love number two. I mean, I must say, I didn't struggle in any way with three, four and five. Mm -hmm. And they are all different. They're bound to be all different. It's just a small mix of casts. There's six or seven casts involved or seven or eight or, or whatever it might be. Each year is going to be different. But just in terms of my own personal favourites, this number two was just always really up there for me. And this is at least on a par with that. Today's the first day that we've, we taste it as we're experimenting with it and working what cast to bring together. Our colleague John Glass looks over, looks after that and he sends through samples to, to a few of us through here. So we've been looking at it as it developed. This is the first time we've tried it in the bottle was actually this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think it's as good for me as the number two, if not even better. Um, I, I love this one. Uh, we'll go to another one from uh, Facebook. Uh, James Kennedy, is it similar to Batch 4? Oh, we've just answered that. Sorry, James. <laughs> Robbie didn't like Batch 4. I personally liked it, uh, but uh, the, we're saying that this Batch 6 is even better. Uh, and do we have anything else from the audience here that would like to answer? Yes, sir. So it was both sherry casks that were made to, to make up this batch, correct? This is, this is, two, this is six use. different casks. Six There's four casks. butts and two hogsheads. And two hogsheads. And yeah. do you know the oak varieties that were of the, of the cask that we used? The what, sherry? sorry? The oak varieties of the sherry cask that we used. Were they American oak sherry casks? Or no, there was no mention of no. that. There was no mention, I didn't... Of the type of oak? Of the type of oak. Oh, you weren't reading your notes. 
Was there was he? notes, was there? There was. Yeah. John was very diligent and he gave us everything to read. Right, okay. So there are, it's, pre it's predominantly uh, first fill European oak, uh, but there is, a, there is at least one American oak right, uh, okay. cherry cask in there. So th in that case, that would be oak from the US imported into Spain, sawn in Spain, made into cask in Spain, sherry put in it in Spain, all the Rosso sherry obviously, matured in Spain. It's just that they're going to get that oak in from America. And as you probably know, the, the, the Spanish uh, sherry industry only uses American oak to mature the sherry. It's to do with, you know, look how much colour and flavour you get in, in, into the whisky from European oak. So it's too much for the sherry. So they always import the cask. But mm -hmm. this is predominantly European oak, but with a little 15% or so of, of uh, American oak too. Uh, we've got... Uh, We've got a couple more questions on Facebook. One of them seems to be some fan mail to Robbie that's inappropriate to read out, so we'll, we'll skip over that and I'll put you in touch with them later, Robbie. Uh, do, we, uh, do, we, do we have any more questions from the audience at this point? Uh, Robbie, you talked earlier on about um, other distilleries needing to be 14, 15 to get this yeah. level. What do you think it is about the Glengoyne spirit that makes it so good at this age? I, it, it is a good question. It's one of these things I've actually pondered on. You know, why? It's, I, know, I know the way we actually distill. We, we have very, very slow distillation. Uh, slower than anywhere else I've worked at. So you kind of think, well, that must be it. There must be something with, uh, I don't know, as I said before, the, the, the chemical ratio of the actual spirit and its contact. It must just be able to get right into the heart of the wood very quickly and draw out what and draw out these flavors and the colors. But I, I, really, I really don't know. It's just, it's, it's my experience. I don't know why these other distillers, because they all make very good whiskey. You know, and they, do, they all do, make, do the very best, but they don't do it the same as Glengoyne and the big difference is in the distillation. So I think it's just the way the guys, you know, uh, the way to the spirit perhaps, you know, it just interacts very well with the wood just to get these colors out at such an early age. We've, we've drawn uh, Glengoyne samples you know, when they're, 12, when they're 12 months old, 18 months, 24 months, and this, the colour isn't far off that, even from 18 months old uh, at Glengoyne. It's just an incredible whisky for really getting into it at a very early age. But it doesn't, it doesn't like, peak at an early age and then drop. It still keeps going, it still keeps maturing, and it keeps mellowing as it's getting older. So it hasn't peaked at eight, it's still got a big, long journey to go. It's just, it's quite, it's an interesting whisky. No, that's, that's, that's a good question. I'm sorry I couldn't give you a specific answer, but the only thing I can think is it's, uh, it's something magic that Duncan does. You know, that's a magic. <laughs> I'll tell you later. He'll, he'll tell you later on what the secret is. Yeah. A couple more questions uh, coming through from Facebook. Uh, John, uh, if, pardon me if I mispronounce your surname, John uh, Quinones. During the maturation process, how do you introduce uh, flavours like honey and leather? So we've, we've talked a lot about the different flavours in here. Just to be really clear on it, uh, 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 the, the regulations around Scotch whisky are really strict, and I think quite rightly so, in that you can add, you can use water, malted barley, and yeast. You can add smokiness to the malted barley by burning peat, and then the other thing you're using is uh, an oak sherry cask or an oak bourbon barrel or whatever it might be. And so all the flavours come from those things, either from the, uh, and, and, and actually, in fact, Robbie talks very well about this, about where does the most flavour come from? So if you're not a peaty distillery, Robbie, uh, and we're talking about this huge range of flavours, which parts of the process are going to give the, the most flavour and the most smell into this bottle and into this glass? The, the, the most flavours, for, for, as you said, unless you're a peaty whisky, it comes from the very end of the process. So the end of the process is, is the cask. You know, so that's where your biggest influence uh, for the, for the flavours is. You know, so kind of, if you imagine that is the cask influence, and then it just, it declines as you go towards the start, the seed, you know, the, the, the field, if you wish, uh, and it drops. Now, it depends on the, on the type of uh, distillery you have. It might drop very quickly from there to the distillations, because the distillation does give a lot of flavors. But at Glengoyne, this, 60% of the flavors will come from the actual maturation but the other 40% come from the distillation and before that, which is, which is huge for a, a Highland single malt. So a lot of the flavors come, and the question there was about the leather. We 
get the leather in at the start. Duncan's on the nosing panel. We've got another three guys and one lady who's on the nosing panel at, uh, at Glengoyne. And every time we make new mix spirit at Glengoyne, we analyze it. So we, take, we put a sample in a small bottle and we then put that small bottle in front of Duncan, myself, and uh, another two colleagues. And they nose it and they write down what there's, what, what, what do you get in there? And what, what do you write down when you, what's? Well, when you get fruitiness, you get leather, you get, um, <coughs> you can get um, flavors like that. You know, yeah, and fruit, fruit, fruity and leather are the two things. Well, they're the two main yeah, ones when, for whenever, me anyway. Whenever I pick up the paper, piece of paper at the end of the week when the guys have analyzed yeah. it, then I'll, then I'll know it as well. I'm looking for two words, fruity, and leather, because yeah. as long as you get fruity and leather, yeah, that's, right. that's it. Job, it, it's right. consistent. It's yep. since it's 1833. It's that's been right. fruity and leather. It's yeah. very boring and very yeah. dull. Leather, you know, it's, that's that's right. it. We get leather. So, so the answer to the question is, we don't. We it comes in at the start. You know, this fruity, this leather it comes in at the very start. But it's then the cask then builds it up. It magnifies it. You know, the evaporation takes some things away that we don't need. Some of them, perhaps lower level sulfur notes. Uh, but the, the, the leathery side of things, the fruitiness, the pineapple that I'm getting in here, that then magnifies during the maturation uh, and it just, it just comes through it. But you've got to have it at the start because you can't introduce it. Yeah. You know, Stuart says you, you can't put anything else in. So if, you, if you've got it wrong from day one, you're never going to get it right from year eight if it isn't right at the start. And there's where whiskey differs from something like bourbon because you go to a store in the US and you see endless flavours and they can, they can add flavours to it. I'm not saying that's wrong, it's right for them, it's maybe not right for us, but uh, you'll see uh, a well-known bourbon brand with honey added, with, with whatever you want added, so you can add flavour to other spirits, but the regulations on Scotch whisky, and I think it's one of our real strong points, it gives us this great uh, sort of a, a long-term nature and view of the industry that you can't add anything to it other than those three ingredients and the rest is coming from the process or or from the cask. Donald uh, Gillespie is asking us that, uh, what is the, in terms of the oak barrels, what is the planning process in terms of the time and the selection, selection criteria and what flavours are you aiming for? So that's more about how we source. And I know that you, uh, you've been to a few uh, siestas in Spain, Robbie. You've, you've done some flamenco dancing. You've been to the bullfights. Could you talk us through what happens in Spain? Well, apart from the flamenco dancing and the bullfights, yes. uh, yeah, what happens in Spain, it's, uh, the trees are grown in the north of Spain. Uh, there's this 200 kilometer stretch. It actually goes into the very southern part of, uh, of France as well. And it's all natural forest, uh, forestation there. They don't plant the trees, they just grow. And they do natural selection. They're allowed to cut down so many trees per year. And then when they put them <coughs> they just naturally grow. And I think from cutting down the tree until having a cast ready, is it six years? Yes, it cut is. It down, cut it down, spends a couple of years in the north of Spain. So drying for two years in the north and then just drying the, the planks effectively That's in, right. in the south for another one year. And then, so what they're doing, so this is, this is all just natural season. What they're doing is just taking the moisture out of the wood. Then after three years of drying, and then they start putting it into the cooperage and then they start making it into these casks. And you've got one or two of them lying behind us here. This, this one here, which is, for example, which is a punching, which comes from, uh, this is a European cask we've got. But hogsheads as well. The only ones you wouldn't come from there is the barrels. But this, this little process takes six years. We go out there two years in advance of us actually needing them at Glengoyne. So we'll go over there and we will actually speak to the cooperage and we'll say the cask we need. They will then go and speak to the guys who have the actual, uh, the salaras who grow the grapes, who have the sherries. They, they will then put the, the correct Oloroso sherry into the cask for us, and then they will season it for 18 months to two years. So from September this year, when we place the order, that's for casks coming, coming in 2000, uh, 2021. Next year, we'll get them for 2022, so it's ongoing. So we're, every year, we go out there, and we're selecting the casks for, the, for two years hence. And it's ongoing, and it's very expensive. Probably, you know, it's something we do, but it's part of the recipe. As you said, more than 60% of the flavour. So it's it's worth, more than 60% of the flavour. Worth flavor. the time, worth the investment. Yeah, you could, you could try and save money, but if you do that, you've, you've, you've changed the recipe. 
A couple of quick messages from the US to go through. Uh, Jennifer says, hello from North Carolina. Uh, I wish you could be there to sample some fun whiskey. Well, Jennifer, Robbie and I wish we were in warm North Carolina with you. Uh, <laughs> neither of those things are going to happen this evening. And uh, secondly, from a good old friend of the distillery by the name of Neil Broom. Neil says, it would be great to see you and Robbie in the US, but only if you bring the whiskey. It's not you I'm interested in. <laughs> Which is, thank you, Neil, for that. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Thank you very much uh, to those of us uh, live here and in the audience for your time and for your, and for your interest. And if you wait behind, you never know what might happen. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, and for our friends on, on Facebook, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for tuning in. I'm delighted in particular that you got to meet these two great gentlemen beside me, as well as Robbie. And thank you, thank you so much for your time. And I just want to end by saying that as of now, the wonderful Glengoyne Teapot Batch 6 is available to buy online, and I'd recommend that you do so. Uh, and I'll end by saying thanks again. And ladies and gentlemen, we give you Glen Goyne yep. Teapot Batch 6. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.